Um, this this uh, is what I want to cover. You'll notice I've, I've not put legislation on here. Uh, that's because I've only got 10 minutes and I could spend an entire 10 minutes whinging about the state of uh, a legislation and its, its poor enforcement. Uh, so I want to concentrate really on the veterinary aspects uh, of, uh, of improving pedigree welfare. A little bit of background first. Um, firstly, we can't even decide how many dogs there are in this country. Uh, and this, I think, raises a, a significant issue about our whole level of surveillance of disease. But there are roughly 8 to 10 million dogs. If life expectancy is something like 10 or 11 years, that means there are 8, 800,000 puppies coming into the, uh, into the dog population every year, of which only 200,000 are registered by the Kennel Club. And if you accept that that's the basis of, uh, of breed standards, then you could start to argue that uh, the Kennel Club influence on the way dogs look is not perhaps as great as you might think at first glance. Uh, when you then take into account the Kennel Club's view that only 1% of dogs are actually shown in a show ring, uh, you might think that the Kennel Club has even less influence over what ends up on your consulting room table. I, I would suggest that actually those 1% that are shown actually represent at least the 200,000 and represent the public view of what the average dog breed should look like. There are also, of course, now increasingly since the change in legislation at the beginning of last year, the influence of dogs being imported into this country from overseas. And we really have no idea what those numbers are. We do know what many of the health risks are. What we don't know is what their influence might be on the whole issue of confirmation. A uh, little bit of history then. Perhaps this, this started off with a, a, a paper by uh, McCreevy and colleagues uh, in Animal Welfare talking about the health and welfare influences of confirmation in pedigree dogs. Cork then, Companion Animal Welfare Council, picked this up uh, and produced a report on breeding and welfare, which didn't just cover dogs, it covered all species. Emma Milne then picked it up at AWF uh, when she talked about designer animals or breeding for welfare. And, uh, of course, she then inspired uh, Jemima Harrison to pick up her television uh, a camera and go out and produce pedigree dogs exposed, which is really what raised the public profile of this as an issue. Following that, there were a number of reports, uh, Associate Parliamentary Group on Animal Welfare, the RSPCA, and the independent report from Professor Sir Patrick Bateson. And those led to the formation on the Advisory Council of the Welfare Issues of Dog Breeding. I think you'll gather from the title that actually there was considerable negotiation around the formation of the Advisory Council, and nobody in their right mind could have sat there and thought up a title like that. So what is a breed standard? Well, here are a couple of quotes from uh, the Kennel Club website, uh, which essentially tell you that they are a description in words of what a dog should look like, and to a certain extent, how it should behave as well. Uh, the standards were reviewed following pedigree dogs exposed in 2008. Um, all of the breeds, all 209, 210 breeds, were reviewed at the time. Uh, and the aim was to produce them fit for function, fit for life. Now, that, in my mind, raises a question uh, particularly about behaviour as well as about confirmation. Is a Border Collie actually fit for function and life on the 25th floor of a block of flats? I would suggest it probably isn't. So there are other influences in this as well as simple confirmation. The review uh, in intended to reduce the number of exaggerations that there were in breeds because that had been the, the basis of a lot of the, uh, of the um, adverse comment that there had been. There was veterinary input into it, and so we as a profession had some into, input into how these standards came out. So let's have a look at a standard. Well, there's a picture uh, of, of a pug from the turn of the 20th century. Um, grateful to Emma Milne for the picture. Uh, I can assure you that's not Emma in the picture. <laughs> the one on the left, that is. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER I did promise you a derogatory remark. Um, and, and that's what we end up with today. 
Uh, and you can see the significant difference uh, in, in those two animals, both called pugs. What's the pug standard actually say? Well, there it is. What's interesting, I think, in this, uh, and, and these, this is something that's come up uh, since the review of standards, if you look at the last couple of sentences, um, eyes or nose never adversely uh, affected or obscured over the nose, pinched nostrils and heavy over nose, unacceptable and should be heavily penalised. So you can argue that the Kennel Club has actually tried quite hard to influence uh, breeders of pedigree dogs to produce less exaggeration and to take, view, take some view of the conformation of the dogs that they breed. So how is it that we still see on our consulting room tables on a daily basis dogs like this? Well, what are the influences that we need to change? Well, of course, the breed standard, and one could argue that actually breed standards need to be more precise, need to be more clear about what is and what should not be in the conformation of a dog, and perhaps uh, a little bit more influence on its behaviour. If you change the breed standard, you should at least in theory change what breeders start to breed to. But when you look at some of the breeds and look at their effective population sizes, uh, there was a paper a couple of years ago which showed that the effective population size of uh, West Highland White Terriers was only 50 individuals. And so breeders have some difficulty in changing the conformation of the dogs that they breed unless they're prepared to outcross. And outcrossing, of course, uh, if you outcross a two pedigree dogs, it becomes non-pedigree. And so you're the, you then have to wait a number of generations before those dogs can then be shown again. And they still have to comply with the breed standard. <coughs> Above all, we have to influence judges at dog shows. Breeders are far more, in my view, influenced by what the judge puts up at a dog show than they are by what, it, what is written on the breed standard. And due credit to the Kennel Club, they do look at what dogs uh, breeders put up, uh, and they look at the confirmation of those dogs, and if judges are consistently putting up uh, dogs with very exaggerated confirmation, then there will be some comment about it. But we've all seen the sort of GSDs that get put up these days with these horrible sloping backs that, that I don't think can conceivably be right. We as veterinary surgeons should have significant influence on the uh, confirmation of dogs. My question is whether we do. We should be reporting surgical modification uh, wherever that affects the confirmation of a dog. If you ask the Kennel Club, a very small proportion, single digit proportion, of reports that they get of modifications of confirmation come from veterinary surgeons. The other 90% come from breeders. Why, as a profession, are we not reporting these? We should be reporting caesareans. Again, a very small proportion of reports come from the profession. They don't, they come from breeders. We should be reporting these. Now, you can argue that actually what happens with the information at the end of the day, uh, is it really worth me reporting? I don't believe that's a valid excuse for us as veterinary surgeons not to do so. Perhaps a little bit of light on the horizon are Vet Compass and Savsnet, and due credit to BSAVA for funding Savsnet, because both of these systems in the long run will provide us with much better information about the, uh, the, the incidence of some of these confirmation defects that we see so frequently. One of the accusations raised quite frequently in the media is that, well, of course, vets don't worry about this. They make money out of all these confirmation problems that they have to put right, don't they? Sincerely hope that's not right, but it is levelled at us as a profession. So what could we do? Well, the Advisory Council, uh, and I uh, admit to being a member, uh, has worked quite hard on some priority issues. And if you want to look at them, uh, they're all on the website. But we've looked at ocular problems linked to head confirmation a major cause of welfare issues in dogs. We've looked at breathing difficulty linked to head, head conformation. Again, the short-nosed breeds, a major uh, issue on welfare. 
Um, AWF worked with the RSPCA to produce the Puppy Information Pack and the contract. And if you look at the Puppy Information Pack, and I hope you're in, uh, encouraging your clients to use it, uh, there's a lot of background information about the genetics of the puppies that they're producing. The Assured Breeder Scheme Kennel Club uh, is now UCAS accredited. Um, the Advisory Council has had a number of meetings with the Kennel Club and we hope that there are going to be some modifications to that standard to make it more or less equivalent to the standard for breeders that the Advisory Council produced. Um, and of course the Kennel Club has introduced the high profile breeds vet checks. Introduced at Crufts last year when half a dozen best of breeds failed and didn't get into the, into the uh, uh, best in show or into the group even. Those are the, uh, the high profile breeds um, and they are the sort of breeds that one would expect, the, the, the short legs, the flat faces and so on. Now as a show vet, uh, I'm asked to look at these dogs and to say whether there is anything which on that day I consider is affecting their welfare. And so, as a show vet, I look at all these 14 breeds, uh, best of breed winners, should be the pinnacle of, of their breeds. So at what point does exaggeration produce a potential welfare problem? And I'm grateful to Sheila Crispin for these slides. Where along that line do you say enough is enough? The right hand end, certainly. And when, as a show vet, I'm faced with a dog like that, if that dog has no uh, sign of soreness of its conjunctiva, has no epiphora, I have to pass the dog. Is that really what we should be asking show veterinary surgeons to do? So in summary then, this, this is a long-standing problem. There's nothing recent about it. Um, the influence of breed standards is there and it is significant. Um, the influence of showing uh, of the veterinary profession and of independent advice will, in the long term, I hope, improve the situation. We have made some progress, but by gum is there a long way to go. Thank you. <laughs> That's Thank just you to prove very the cats much. are really on top. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Questions, please. Emma's got the hand straight into the air, I think, is <laughs> a straight comeback for you, Chris, so get the uh, armour on. Um, Emma Milne again. Um, one thing that I just, I, obviously I could talk at length, but I won't. Um, the one thing that I found really interesting recently, um, Chris and I have both done AWF lectures and debates recently on this subject at some of the vet schools, um, and I did one at Edinburgh a few weeks ago. And this is one of the great things about working with the students, is that in the debate, one of them said, surely the dogs who fail those vet checks at the shows should be banned from breeding or taken off the Casey register to make sure that happens, which seemed to me to be a fantastic and very common sense idea. Um, so I wondered what your thoughts on that were, and I just thought I'd put it out there because it seemed just leaving it in a hall in Edinburgh, it probably wouldn't go very far, but it might be something to take to the Kennel Club. I think that's a very reasonable point of view. Uh, and certainly when I'm doing this, I, I spend as much of my time lecturing the person who's showing the dog, saying, look, I'm going to pass the dog this today because it's not showing any welfare issues, but it's got all this potential. Uh, and one day you will be failed. Now, it's interesting the number of failures has dropped dramatically over the last year. Uh, and it may be that breeders are beginning to get the message, but they would certainly get the message much better if a dog that failed at a, at a show was banned from showing in the future. This please in the middle. Um, Francesca Drummond, former AWF trustee, but working for Animal Health. Um, the naive owner who buys a puppy pedigree puppy and perhaps 12 months later is faced with very steep bills due to deformities, abnormalities clearly associated with the breed, would they or their insurers ever have a civil claim against the breeder of that animal? Interestingly this has happened quite recently in, in Holland and the case is currently pending. Um, 
one of the issues, of course, is the Sale of Goods Act, um, which says that if you sell something, it has to be fit for purpose. Unfortunately, only applies to commercial organisations. So as the majority of dog breeders are individuals breeding from their own private premises, um, the Sale of Goods Act doesn't apply in those circumstances. The difficulty with this is if, if you have issues, for instance, like hip dysplasia, where there is clearly a genetic element, but there is also an environmental element. And so if you wanted to take it up as a civil case, it would be difficult to prove that the, the end result, the dog's hips, was entirely a result of, of the breeding. What, what the, uh, the, the advisory council standard says is that um, Essentially, if, if, if you're going to breed from a breed which has, for instance, hip dysplasia, you should have the preventive uh, test done, in other words, the dog should be x-rayed and scored. Um, and the score, and, uh, and there has to be some consideration of those hip scores when you, when, you, when you breed. So that you could argue, for instance, that if the hip score was less than the breed average, that would be acceptable. If the hip score was greater than the breed average, that wouldn't be acceptable. Uh, it's much more clear cut where you have DNA tests where uh, you can differentiate uh, homozygous uh, carriers, uh, homozygous affected and unaffected. Um, and, and so you can, you can then work out that if, if you've got um, a carrier dog, you should only ever breed it to a, a, a genetically clear dog. That way you'll never produce a, uh, an affected dog. So that may be a way forwards. The, the, the disadvantage, of course, is the cost of civil litigation. Thank you. Rebecca Garcia, from representing the Association of Government Vets today, uh, working in the Deaf Animal Welfare Team, but employed by AHVLA. A uh, very interesting talk, Chris, thanks very much. You've mentioned a number of changes that can take place to actually start improving welfare of, of animals with conformity and behavioral issues. I, I would like to go back to a comment made earlier this morning about banning something or, or modifying something that is happening, and that is how to affect demand. And thinking of the scenario with your pack dog, if somebody wants a pack, some people will want a pack with a wrinkly nose, and that's how they think a pack should look, so that's, that's what they want to buy. So my question is, how do you think demand for this type of dogs and this type of aesthetics could be changed, and who do you think would be placed to actually take that forward? Um, ed education is clearly a key in all of this, these sort of issues. Um, I'm afraid I've become, over the years, a confirmed skeptic when it comes to education. For how many years have we been saying to people buying puppies, you should see the puppy with its mother and the rest of the litter? And how, how many people still go on the internet because they can, because they can get the puppy tomorrow, and take delivery of the puppy in Sainsbury's car park? And how many of those do you see on your consulting room table as puppies that have got clear problems? Um, so, yes, it would be lovely if we could educate people uh, in, into uh, buying the right thing. But sadly, there are enough uh, less responsible breeders, puppy farmers out there, who are quite happy to go on breeding anything that they can call the pedigree dog and selling it for a significant amount of money, uh, either over the internet or through a pet shop. Thank you. I'm going to take I'm only afraid I'm only going to take one more comment down here because it is um, now well and truly into tea time. Um, Jenny Price, student at Nottingham Vet School. Um, I was just wondering if alongside the efforts to control the breeding of specific breeds that do have predispositions to problems, whether there's also an ongoing effort to control imports so that we don't just push these breeders and what have you overseas. There seems to be a bit of an influx of dogs coming from Spain and places like that. Sadly, I think actually the reverse is true. Since the changes in legislation, the number of imported puppies has gone up very significantly. And of course, they are coming from the classic sell them cheap, um, no regard to the welfare of the animals uh, type breeder. And many of them coming from, from countries like Lithuania and Romania. Um, 50 puppies stuffed in the back of a van, imported. Um, and if you look on the internet now, many of the websites on the internet 
the fact that a puppy's got a passport aged eight weeks when clearly it can't have a legal passport because it can't have been vaccinated, uh, but it's, it's being used as a selling point on the internet, and people are sadly are ignorant enough still to buy. And I think we as a profession have a, a, a major task to educate owners not to buy the puppies like that.